Today we're going to be looking at athletes and longevity. And the first thing you get here on Google is that participation in elite athletics does increase your lifespan. Now the statistics can be quite complicated here and what people count in the deaths, a lot of people exclude suicides or violent deaths, which do seem to be quite high in a lot of sports. Now in the conclusions here is where we see a lot of trouble. They seem to really not know what causes the increased longevity supposedly. They do blame genetics and other factors. And here we see interestingly that the athletes who participate in low impact have similar longevity to those in high impact and high intensity. So rather than compare to the average population, we're just going to look at what kills athletes. We'll start with some more famous cases like Reggie Lewis. Now he collapsed during a playoff game in 1993 and then shortly thereafter died of basically a cardiomyopathy heart attack. It was called sudden heart attack. And they call this type of heart disease cardiomyopathy. They also call it athlete's heart, sometimes enlarged heart. It's also known as Qishan disease in China. And they have basically eradicated this problem in China with selenium supplementation. You can see here the constricted blood flow of the heart. This disease is known in the animal industry because animals that are born with white muscle disease typically die of a cardiomyopathy heart attack shortly after birth. And we know in the agricultural world that this is a selenium and cofactor deficiency. Now this white muscle disease in animals is known as muscular dystrophy in humans. See this link clearly in Kishan disease where most of the patients die of cardiomyopathy heart attack or enlarged heart or athlete's heart as it's otherwise called or sudden infant death syndrome as it's sometimes called as well when in infants and many if not most or all of these patients also have muscular dystrophy or what we might also call cystic fibrosis and the Kishan province in China has virtually eliminated all of these problems with basically mandatory selenium supplementation in childhood. So cystic fibrosis is just another name for this same essential problem showing up in other parts of the body and you can see here the enlarged heart is one of the keystones of it as well that these people usually die from the respiratory component. Back to athletes, now Eddie Guerrero died at 38 years old of arteriosclerotic cardiovascular disease and this is has more to do with the veins than with the heart itself and the plaque in the veins is caused by oxidative damage or free radical damage. And we do know about this in animals because animals don't need to have steroids or cheeseburgers to get arteriosclerosis as we would call it in humans. All they need to do is be fed oxidized grains or some improperly f stored food where it's able to oxidize. Heath Benedict was a top draft pick for the NFL in 2008. He died at 24 years old of an enlarged heart, as we know, athlete's heart or cardiomyopathy. Mitchell Cole was an English footballer or a soccer player. He died at age 27 of a cardiomyopathy heart attack. He had retired the year earlier because of a known heart condition. They just, they knew about the condition. They just didn't know how to help him. Jason Collier was an NBA player. He died at 28 of a heart attack. They said it was due to an abnormally enlarged heart. Jesse Marundi died at age 27. They said his cause of death was a genetic heart defect, but he died of cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is, they go on to say, a leading cause of sudden cardiac death in athletes. Damian Nash died when he was 24 years old after his first season in the NFL with the Denver Broncos, and they said that his death was a natural cardiac event and the cause is undetermined. Like Damian Nash, Zeke Upshaw died during a game and he died of a cardiomyopathy heart attack, and they said that he had abnormalities in his heart that they did not know about before. And this was in 2018, he was 28 years old. Bern Dietrich died at 21 years old of a cardiac event while swimming. William Wayne Jones was 19 years old when he collapsed with cardiomyopathy during a game with Tennessee State University. Eddie Key III was 18 years old when he died of pneumonia and he played football for Wayne State University. So we're going to look here at some of the supposed long-lived athletes and I've been looking for good examples of high intensity athletes and a, a good kind of story on how long they were in the sport and here we're not really getting a lot of information in a lot of them and some of them like they only played for one season or you know they went on to coaching and they live for 60 years after their supposed professional career so I just I haven't yet found any great examples within here and again there's not a lot of information some of them it does say they died of a heart disease or something like that but usually it just says they they just died you know it just gives their lifespan Jordan McNair was 18 when he collapsed during a football game of heat stroke and he was later rushed to the hospital where they gave him an emergency liver transplant and he died shortly after the transplant. Heat stroke, by the way, is preventable with hydration, particularly using salt, the most important electrolyte in the body. And the priority is cooling down the core temperature any way possible with 
cold bath, cold water, ice, even a cold water enema with a garden hose can be used in an extreme circumstance. And if you did have liver disease requiring a liver transplant, we know in animals that this is caused by a selenium deficiency, either cirrhosis of the liver or fatty liver disease. Corey Stringer, an NFL player, also died of a heat stroke. He was age 27. Fab Mello, a professional basketball player, allegedly died of natural causes at age 26 when he went to bed and never woke up. So looking at these individual death cases is much different than creating a statistical picture and I find it much more interesting actually and I would be interested to see the rate of homicide, suicide, and car accidents compared to the general population and if being involved in something like the football league would make it more likely that you would die in these things. The last 20 years of deaths here in the NFL, most of them are car accidents, nine of them are car accidents, three suicides, three murders, three heart-related attacks, one heat stroke, that was Corey Stringer, one seizure, one cancer, and one pulmonary embolism, which is kind of like a lung attack instead of a heart attack. And here we've got basketball players, not just the NBA, but the feeder leagues as well for the last 20 years, and out of them there was five murders, six heart-related deaths, three car accidents, two cancers, one died in the sleep that was Fab Mello, one suicide, and then one accidental fall. Now they do say that NBA players live longer than the average person, but I do believe that this is because many of the people included are people who were born as far back as 1920, and of course the nutritional landscape was much different back then. So they do say that the longest lived sport is tennis, and I was unable to find really much interesting about golf players and this kind of thing. There's there's quite a few Olympic athletes that are dying young of this and that, but it all forms pretty much the same picture. If they don't die of something violent or car accident, then they do die of something that we know of as a mineral deficiency at its root. So they essentially die as the same things as the rest of the population. You know, there's a few asthma related deaths in there, cancer related deaths. These are going to be more complicated than simple mineral deficiencies. They're going to have digestive components as well. And they're saying here, after 35 years old, they're more likely to die from coronary artery disease rather than cardiomyopathy heart attack and this makes sense it takes time to accumulate plaque in the arteries and it's caused by the same thing in them as it is in the general population which is consuming oxidized foods especially oils fried food processed meat well done red meat burnt animal fats of any kind and charred food of any kind this is a map of the distribution of selenium in america and that is the deficiency that is behind the cardiomyopathy athlete's heart enlarged heart and basically generalized heart failure as well as muscular dystrophy, cystic fibrosis, sudden infant death syndrome, and many other things that show up as symptoms, selenium deficiency, it has a lot to do with thyroid function for instance. So it's pretty much a wild card of whether you're going to get selenium in your food, and if your food is not organic then that means it was sprayed with pesticides, and the pesticides kill the fungus in the soil, and of course the mineral needs to be pre-digested by the fungus in order to be absorbed by the plant. Things being equal, the athlete is losing more nutrition, especially the minerals and the selenium and the electrolytes and the things that they're deficient in when they ultimately die of these problems. They're more deficient than the person next to them who is not going out of their way to sweat out the nutrients. Also, if you experience an injury of any kind or you know, even a higher stress environment, it's going to demand more nutritional needs from you, especially any of these immune problems. But selenium is required for the, a healthy immune system. It is required for the body's proper utilization of glutathione which is made in most cells in the body, but the body can't utilize correctly without selenium. So just some closing remarks here on the statistics. Now, the reason that I don't really like the statistics is because most of the people that we're looking at, i.e. the people who are alive today, they're not dead yet, so we can't include them in the overall picture. We can only measure people who have already died against the average lifespan you know, of the population in general or of another sport we can only compare them with some other closed group and that group isn't closed until the athletes themselves die so we'll have to wait several decades to discover how long athletes you know that were born say past 1975 how long they live compared to the average population who was born past 1975 again of course most of those people are still alive today whether they're in the general population or whether they are a professional athlete and we are making the case here that these nutritional deficiency problems are escalating due to the decreased supply in the soil and in the food supply ultimately. And we really only focused on selenium here, but there are 59, at least 59 other essential minerals and they work in conjunction with at least 30 other essential nutrients to make the body work properly. And of course the athlete is putting more stress on the body in multiple ways and directly losing a lot of these nutrients in the soup that is sweat. So they are at an increased risk of these deficiencies, deficiency-related symptoms and deficiency-related deaths. 
So movement and exercise clearly is important. The longest lived populations, including the Hunza, is one of them is pictured here. They do value work and work extremely hard, but these people do have access to many more micronutrients than we do in our modern food supply. So the lesson is to make sure that we are replenishing what we are losing, especially if we're an athlete. And definitely check out my newest book, Fake Diseases. It covers all of the major topics that come up like birth defects, blood sugar problems, bone and joint problems, cancer, autoimmune problems, and more. And it's on Amazon for just $9.99. And the audiobook read-along version is free here on YouTube, and the link for that is in the description of this video. And I've also published a book in response to some of Dr. Wallach's criticisms, including the major articles that have been written against him on the internet. So if you are a Dr. Wallach fan or a Longevity distributor, I definitely recommend having this book in your toolkit. And of course, make sure to check out our food page, Notice Foods, that's on YouTube and at Notice Foods on Instagram. We have a lot of content up there teaching you how to cook without the bad foods that Dr. Wallach describes and Dr. Glidden's 12 bad foods, all of that, all of the rules that you need to know. And we have experienced chefs and bakers who will answer the questions in those inboxes.